Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Glad, uh, pleasure being here at the uh, Open Source Summit uh, Europe 2024, and uh, glad you could all make it uh, the end of the day. And today, I'd like to talk to you about uh, navigating the open source observability landscape. And talking about landscape, who knows what that is? <laughs> so that's the uh, CNCF uh, landscape, and uh, that's usually how people react to that. And that's a known meme, and uh, that's how I reacted to it, first time that I saw it. Um, and uh, yeah, to be honest, it's huge, it's uh, overwhelming, and you can very easily uh, get lost in it. And uh, I was afraid I was the only one, but uh, luckily I'm not. As you can see when I posted it, I got lots of uh, support from the community, lots of funny comments. So uh, yeah, I'm not alone. And if you feel like that, know that you're not alone. And uh, I'm here to try and help you a bit with, uh, with this problem. So my name is Dotan Horvitz. I'm, uh, as you can see, a DevOps specialist. Uh, I've been uh, around working with uh, DevOps in general and observability in particular in the space for many, many years uh, with vendors, with uh, open source tools, with the community. Um, uh, currently, I'm between jobs, so if you have anything interesting, grab me after the, after the talk. Uh, and I'm also, as my t-shirt indicates, I'm also a CNCF ambassador, so uh, you can blame me for some of this mess. And if you have any questions about the CNCF stack, CNCF ecosystem, uh, feel free to uh, grab me afterwards or uh, visit me at the uh, CNCF booth in the uh, Solution uh, Expo. Happy to answer any questions about that. Um, and I also run a podcast called Open Observability Talks about open source DevOps and uh, observability. So if you like this talk topic, uh, you most likely uh, are going to like this podcast. So check it out on your uh, YouTube or your favorite podcast platform where you get your podcasts, uh, Open Observability Talks. Uh, and lastly, you can find me everywhere at Horovitz. My surname is my handle everywhere. So Twitter, Mastodon, LinkedIn, Medium, YouTube, whatnot. Uh, feel free to uh, DM me if you have anything interesting. And if you're tweeting or tooting anything out of this talk, feel free to tag me. So with that, let's go uh, straight to the uh, CNCF landscape that I mentioned. And as you can see here, it's pretty massive. It's pretty comprehensive. It covers CICD, databases, data streaming, messaging, orchestration, service meshes, networking. Uh, what do we see here? Um, uh, storage, runtime, security, configuration, management, and automation. You name it, the CNCF landscape has it. So we're here for, to talk about observability, right? So let's zoom on uh, observability only. That should focus us, right? Not exactly, as you can see, it's still, still quite, uh, quite a bit. Uh, but don't worry, I'm not going to go one by one uh, into each and every one of those. And um, thank God. And actually, these are not even comparable. And that's the important thing. Uh, let's first understand what, uh, what are the categories and functionality uh, in observability to make sense into all the different options and tools out there. So a word about what is observability. As you can see, the formal definition of observability is a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from knowledge of its external outputs. And that definition, by the way, is actually taken from control theory, so from applied math, not even from computer science. Uh, and I have a, a different uh, definition that I like better for software systems, but we'll put it aside for now. In this definition, uh, when you talk about software systems, what are these external outputs that you see here in the definition? What do you think? Metrics. Metrics. Logs. Traces, logs. Exactly. So in the case of software systems, these external outputs are essentially the telemetry that our systems emit, and indeed primarily metrics, traces, and logs, which are also known as the three pillars of observability. Um, and, and I hate the term three pillars uh, because observability uses many signals, as I'll, I'll, sh I'll soon show you, but indeed metrics, logs, and traces are, uh, or MLT is sometimes called, these are the fundamental uh, signals that help us understand 
what happened, why it happened, and where it happened in our system. Uh, and the reason is that metrics usually tell us what happened. So a system is down, or suddenly an endpoint is very slow to respond. Or, uh, this is the thing that metrics will tell us, obviously, usually uh, together with uh, alerting on these metrics. And then logs tell us or help us understand why it happened, because there's tons of information that the developers put inside the logs about what goes on in the, in the business logic that they wrote. And then traces help us um, understand where it happened, to diagnose the problem uh, through the distributed transaction and all the interacting microservices. So these are the, indeed the classical uh, signals. Uh, but there's no reason to limit ourselves uh, to just logs, metrics, and traces. Uh, we humans tend to favor the rule of three, but there's nothing holy in this trinity. And um, this is why, by the way, I hate the term three pillars. Um, and other th signals may uh, uh, be required to gain better observability into our system. And we need to be flexible to incorporate these uh, as we need, the different raw data, essentially. And indeed, we see um, uh, out there lots of discussions about uh, other signals, such as events, exceptions, profiles, snapshots, and others. By the way, I put a QR code for a brief on, on uh, specifically on profiles. I think it's uh, the most prominent uh, signal today. Uh, so these are the different signals. Now, when we apply that to tools, then it's very interesting. Tools used to be uh, specialized and focused on the specific signals. So you, we used to talk about log analytics tool or log management tool and then tracing tool and so on and so forth. However, the trend that we've seen in the past few years is that tools have broadened scope into broader observability. So now we see that different tools cover different subsets of the uh, signals. And this is the first dimension by which you need to analyze the tools and understand the fit. So first thing, as I said, observability uses many signals. Next, observability also involves many functions. Uh, and we can talk about the functions uh, in groups. We, talk, we can talk about the uh, instrumentation on the application side, and then we can talk about the collection, and then we can talk about the backend analytics. So instrumentation is actually making our application emit uh, telemetry. And for that, we need different functions, such as uh, we need APIs uh, and SDKs to do manual instrumentation. In some cases, we use we have client libraries and auto-instrumentation agents that help us instrument our application without uh, code changes or with very little code change. Um, so this is uh, the types of functions that we will be looking for in, on the application side. Then the next uh, bulk is the function of functionality is on the collector, agent, daemon, uh, whatever you'd like to call it, which is essentially the data processing pipeline with functions such as the ingestion, uh, the uh, sanitization of the data, uh, PII reduction, uh, sampling, aggregation, roll-ups, uh, all sorts of transformations and, and uh, uh, format conversions. That's the second bulk of functions. And then there's the, the functions on the analytics backend uh, that uh, have functions such as uh, store, query, visualize, alert, and so on. So as you can see, many functions involved in observability. And again, when applied to tools, different tools uh, provide different subsets of these uh, functions. So you have a tool that only does visualize and then tool that does uh, store and visualize, and then tools that do collect and store, and, or uh, instrument and collect. So really different combinations. Again, another dim dimension by which you need to understand the tool that you're uh, evaluating. And the last, but obviously uh, not least, is we have open source and proprietary uh, tools and solutions. And very important, going back to the CNCF landscape, it's important to emphasize that the CNCF landscape also contains vendor solutions, okay? So it's not just open source. And actually, and I, I took a screenshot here of the, the filtering options, you can filter according to the license, as you can see here on the, on the right-hand side, and you can filter uh, the landscape for CNCF or non-CNCF projects. So it's pretty fl uh, flexible. And if you are looking for a vendor solution, you can also filter by organization, as it's called on the filter. So you can look for specific 
uh, solutions of the organization or, or company or vendor of your choice. So uh, this filtering is really powerful uh, and you can, it can help you navigate the CNCF uh, landscape. By the way, you have the URL, you saw that also on the previous slides, the short URL is l.cncf.io a short link directly to the uh, landscape uh, and you'll see more filtering capabilities by, by category, by tag and, and others. So okay now uh, in this talk obviously we'll talk only about open source tools so we can filter only to open source uh, primarily CNCF so that should be much easier uh, problem to talk about right? So no? It's not an easier problem and actually to make things worse many of these projects are also actually called open x open something which makes it even more confusing at some point after hearing this question more and over and over again i even wrote a a, a quick a, a dictionary a while back you have the qr code here to make an order into this confusion so i'd like to go over the main tools uh, uh, and to show you the main tools, but also to guide you how to map those tools according to the dimensions that I mentioned before, so that you can actually apply the same methodology also to other projects, other tools uh, that you may encounter, even if not covered on this talk. So now it's time to finally look at some tools. And the first tool I'd like to go over is Open Telemetry. The, the business card of Open Telemetry, as you can see, it's an observability framework for generating and capturing observability telemetry data across uh, traces, metrics, logs, and more, uh, as we'll see. It actually started as a merge of two other open source projects, Open Census and Open Tracing. Again, lots of Open X, as you can see. So if any one of you uh, still uses Open Tracing or Open Census, it's deprecated, time to move to open telemetry. Uh, it uh, reached CNCF incubation back in 2021. Uh, it's already GA or stable as it's called in the CNCF terms uh, across traces, metrics and logs. Uh, and if you want to learn more about uh, open telemetry, I put a QR code for a beginner's guide to open telemetry that I wrote. Um, very good uh, overview of the different components. And now I want to uh, show you uh, open telemetry with the dimensions that I talked about before. So first of all, the signals. As you heard from uh, the previous slide, in terms of signals, it's very comprehensive. It covers traces, metrics, and logs, all three in GA, and already expanding to additional signals beyond the three pillars, uh, primarily profiles, that is still experimental signal. So that's on the signal type. Now let's talk about the functionality that it provides. The first one is actually not the functionality of the tool, but is something underlying the functionality, which is an open specification. Okay? Open telemetry uh, defines an open uh, uh, vendor neutral uh, and language agnostic, programming language agnostic specification for the API, the SDK, and the data. Data model, data specification, uh, semantic conventions, and so on. And that's uh, something that is becoming, quickly becoming a de facto standard uh, specification. Then on the tooling side, we have, again, starting with the application side, it provides for each programming language, one API and one SDK for instrumenting your application on a manual instrumentation. And then for many languages, it also offers uh, auto-instrumentation agents. Uh, so that's on the API and the uh, instrumentation side. Then it has a collector, open telemetry collector, that uh, provides uh, a very pluggable approach where you can uh, have, you have receivers that can ingest telemetry from many sources. Uh, so you have a, a Kubernetes receiver, a Docker, Kafka, MySQL, Redis, uh, uh, obviously the vendors like uh, AWS X-Ray, GCP PubSub, Azure, whatnot. You have receivers for each and every one of those. Then you have processes to do many things, such as filter, batch, uh, uh, sample, uh, modify, aggregate, whatnot. And you can, you can concatenate and you can uh, chain them to get more elaborate logic. And then you can send this to any backend of your choice. And that's important. Open Telemetry project does not provide a backend of its own, but it does support 
a multitude of backends thanks to these exporters. So it has exporters for many vendors, cloud providers, open source tools. So uh, AWS X-Ray, Azure Monitor, Google, Prometheus, Jaeger, Zipkin, and obviously all the big uh, uh, vendors like uh, Datadog, New Relic, uh, Splunk, uh, uh, everyone essentially, Sumo Logic, everyone has exporters uh, to their platform. And the last thing that it has is OTLP protocol, Open Telemetry uh, Protocol, which is essentially general purpose telemetry data delivery uh, protocol. It can serve uh, to between the SDK and the collector. It can serve between the collector and your backend. It can serve between intermediary nodes. It's really a, a, a general purpose uh, data delivery protocol, client server uh, over gRPC primarily, so uh, really effective and efficient. Uh, so that, that's OpenTelemetry in a nutshell. It's, it's the second most active project in the CNCF, second after Kubernetes itself, so very, very active, uh, widely used, uh, supported by many tools, as you can see. And the big news in OpenTelemetry are that it's, uh, I'm glad to say that OpenTelemetry is now evaluated for graduation. So uh, uh, if you want to support, go to that GitHub issue and uh, express your support, give your like or, or whatnot. Uh, really hoping to see that uh, materializing very soon. Uh, that's the big news uh, around Open Telemetry these days. So that's Open Telemetry. The next project is Prometheus. And Prometheus was built as an internal tool by SoundCloud back in 2015, so almost a decade old, a uh, very veteran project. And then they open sourced it and it's, it was accepted to the CNCF incubation back in 2016. Uh, and then reached graduation in 2018. It, in fact, it was the second project to have reached graduation in the CNCF after Kubernetes. So a uh, really established project. It's used by tens of thousands of, of, uh, of users uh, in production, very wide ecosystem. Uh, if you want to uh, hear more about uh, the ecosystem, I put a QR code here, a review by um, uh, Julian Pivotto, one of the core maintainers of Prometheus, get a very good overview uh, of the Prometheus roadmap, the ecosystem and the updates and so on. And now again, let's look at the tool through the same uh, dimensions we talked about before. So first of all, in terms of signals, Prometheus is strictly focused on metrics, okay? Metrics, very focused. However, in terms of functionality, it's very, very wide, okay? Uh, let's break it down. So first of all, it has a, uh, a specification, a very uh, popular exposition format for exposing metrics uh, that is uh, supported by most common tools and frameworks out there. So uh, whatever you use, Kafka, RabbitMQ, MongoDB, MySQL, Redis, uh, uh, Elasticsearch, Apache, Nginx, Jira, uh, GitHub, obviously all the cloud vendors, AWS ECS, uh, Azure Health, everyone has out-of-the-box support for exposing metrics in this format. And by the way, if you know uh, open metrics, who, who knows open metrics with a show of hands? No one. So if you hear open metrics, well, you're a CNCF ambassador, it's not fair. Uh, if you hear about that, it used to be a, a separate project that spun off of Prometheus, but very recently, last month actually, or two months ago, it uh, mer was merged back into Prometheus. So if you hear open metrics, you can think about it for all things and purposes as Prometheus exposition format. Uh, so that's one format. The other format is remote, right? Prometheus remote, right? which is uh, uh, the format for exposing the bulk metrics to the backend analytics tool. So both formats have become pretty much a de facto standard in the industry. Um, in addition to that, there's the auto discovery mechanism uh, for uh, discovering essentially the, uh, the pieces in your, the components, the services in your system. And that's a very powerful uh, thing that it, uh, it provides. It has many uh, uh, service discovery mechanisms from many environments, AWS, Azure, Google, DigitalOcean, Docker, Kubernetes, what you name it. Uh, so it will automatically discover that. And then it has the ability to do metric scraping, what it's called metric scraping in, in Prometheus terms, which is essentially pool mode fetching your metrics from these components that it or targets, as it's called in Prometheus terms. Uh, uh, fetching them uh, to a central entity. Now let's move on to the backend analytics, and there it covers a lot of ground, as you can see. It has a time series database for storing the metrics. It has a PromQL query language for querying that, uh, the, uh, these uh, metrics, and a query UI to explore the metric data and to run queries on that data. Uh, one note on that, it's for, as I mentioned, querying the, the, and running queries. It's not for building dashboards and visualization. 
Most people use Grafana, open source for that. It's, Grafana is not under the CNCF, it's, it's uh, owned by uh, Grafana Labs, but uh, it's an open source tool, uh, a GPL license, um, and many use that. There are other alternatives like uh, Percy's project, the young project that just recently joined the CNCF uh, sandbox and others. So that's the, the dashboard building. It's not part of Prometheus uh, set of functionalities. And then there's also alert manager for exposing alerts, uh, defining alerts, alert rules on your matrices, and then exposing them and they, as they trigger to external uh, entities. So very rich, uh, obviously Kubernetes native. So if you run Kubernetes, it's very much out of the box to monitor it with uh, Prometheus, a vast ecosystem, as I mentioned. And the hot news around Prometheus, Last week uh, in Berlin, not far away from here, there was PromCon, the yearly conference of uh, Prometheus community, and the big hot of the press, uh, the long-awaited major release, Prometheus 3.0 is finally released. So uh, clap of hands for the maintainers there. Amazing, amazing achievement. It took only seven years of, uh, of uh, version 2.x with, I think, 54 minor releases. Finally, we have 3.0. Uh, they actually released it on stage. It was very nice. So the beta is out and uh, towards KubeCon, the, the GA should be out. Uh, it offers deep open telemetry support. So the aim of the project is to become the de facto storage for open telemetry metrics. Um, it also offers new UI, remote write 2.0, native histograms, and much more. So if you want to hear more about, uh, uh, about uh, 3.0, Prometheus 3.0, check out this episode. They just had it last week around uh, PromCon. With, this is uh, Julius Foltz, the creator of uh, Prometheus back in uh, early days in SoundCloud. And I interviewed him on my uh, podcast to hear all the greatest uh, news there. Lots of uh, interesting things that he shared there. The next tool that I'd like to cover is Jaeger. And Jaeger was also built by, by a company uh, for their own needs, for, in this case, Uber, back in 2015. So again, almost a decade old, uh, inspired by Google Dapa and uh, Zipkin. Zipkin is another open source, uh, more veteran open source in the distributed tracing uh, space. Uh, if you want to hear, by the way, how Uber used it internally for their massive scale architecture, then again, you have a QR code. I, I talked to uh, uh, one of the Uber uh, folks that worked on Jaeger internally within Uber. Fascinating uh, way how they handled the, their massive scale architecture. Um, uh, it was accepted to the CNCF incubation back in 2017 and reached graduation in 2019. So it's a graduated project for uh, uh, five years now, very stable project, as you can see. Um, and again, let's analyze it according to the same methodology. So in terms of signals, Jaeger is focused on tracing, okay? Distributed tracing, trace data. In terms of functionality, uh, in the application instrumentation, it moved to using open telemetry. So it used to have its own traces and so on. Now it uses open telemetry's SDKs to all instrument and send the trace data, the spans, as it's called. And then there is the Jaeger collector for collecting that span data and, and reconstructing the full traces. And then on the backend side, uh, the, the parts that you see in green are parts that are not part of the project. So all the data stack, as you can see, is external to Jaeger. You will use external database, typically Elasticsearch, OpenSearch, uh, uh, Cassandra, and so on. Uh, you can potentially use Kafka to uh, stream and back pressure if you, if you expect to uh, have a lot of uh, trace data. You can use Flink and so on. So all of that external to the project. Uh, and then the project offers the ingesta, the query engine, and the analytics UI, where you can actually visualize with a famous gun chart and, and timeline view and, and analyze your traces. So that's uh, Jaeger, and Jaeger also has hot news, so hot off the press, Jaeger v V2 is coming. Uh, actually, the RC, the release candidate, RC1, was just released uh, a couple of days ago, so really uh, hot off the press. Uh, and Jaeger V2 is going to offer a new architecture that is uh, uh, all the backend components are going to be based on open telemetry uh, collector framework as the base and then extend it with Jaeger's uh, unique functionality. So 
We'll have native support for OTLP uh, data format, that's the protocol if you remember, uh, batched data processing, it will inherit all the core features of the uh, open telemetry collector that I mentioned, like uh, uh, authentication, certification reloading, internal monitoring, health checks, uh, uh, Z pages, etc. And obviously access to all the open telemetry collector uh, ecosystem. So you have a Kafka receiver, you get it for free in Jaeger. You have a, a whatever receivers, all of that eco ecosystem I talked about now will be inherently part of uh, Jaeger's uh, collector. And this is going to be the topic of my next episode. I invited Yuri Shkuro, the creator of Jaeger back in the Uber days. Today he's at Meta. So if you want to hear more about V2, I'm actually excited to hearing more about V2, uh, then uh, this is going to be the next episode. Uh, check out the, the show. And the last uh, project I want to cover uh, today in depth is OpenSearch. You probably heard OpenSearch quite a bit uh, at the conference so far, but it started uh, by AWS back in 2021 as a fork of Elasticsearch and Kibana after uh, these projects were relicensed off open source. So from Apache 2.0, they became non-open source. Uh, who, who knows uh, Elasticsearch with a show of hands? Okay, we have quite a few, so that's good. Um, so if you want to read more, by the way, on, on, the, how, uh, on the fork, on the relicensing and how OpenSearch started, again, you have a, a QR code here for more details on, on that fascinating journey. Um, and by the way, interesting to see the different, how different projects start. So uh, a project starting as a fork of uh, another project or starting as an internal tool uh, that is open sourced by, uh, by an end user like Uber and, uh, and uh, SoundCloud or even as a merge of other open source tools like uh, uh, OpenTelemetry. So really fascinating. Um, and uh, it was launched in GA back in 21, uh, already has like 21 releases, 700 million downloads, uh, very active, 75 project partners, thousands of contributors, uh, 200 maintainers, so really uh, impressive stats. Uh, and again, let's look at it through the same uh, dimensions we talked about. So uh, as it started from Elasticsearch, obviously uh, it started from log analytics, but it has since uh, uh, expanded into tracing and more recently into metrics. I don't know if you saw today on the keynote talking about Prometheus integration. Uh, it was very exciting to hear the director of product there talking about this. Um, so open, and if I break down the, the so that was, that's the signals. Now let's talk about the functionality that we talked about. So uh, on the functionality, open search is like, think about it like Elasticsearch, okay? That's the database, the, the document data, data store. Uh, and then open search dashboards is like Kibana. So that's the visualization tool on top of the uh, uh, database. There's also data prepper that is like a step before, like the collector that I talked about that can collect, ingest, and process the data. Uh, in terms of querying, it supports Lucene, which is the native querying language for Elasticsearch. So all, everyone who knows Elastic, the Elk stack will probably be familiar with that. They also have uh, their own uh, PPL language that is uh, meant for... Uh, uh, so an, another language, I won't go into the details, but another query language that can be used. Um, and then in terms of sources, as you can see, FluentBit, OpenTelemetry, the Prometheus integration I mentioned before. So all of that can be served from the uh, 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 ingestion part. And the big news for those who missed, obviously, OpenSearch join, is joining the uh, Linux Foundation. So really uh, a round of applause for having that as part of our ecosystem. <laughs> Uh, really exciting, yesterday on the keynote on stage here at the uh, uh, Open Source Summit, uh, and that means that AWS has transitioned the uh, OpenSearch code base to be under the Linux Foundation, so whoever was hesitant saying, okay, it's still owned by a single vendor, no, it's no longer owned by a single vendor, it's owned by the Open Source Foundation of the uh, Linux Foundation, and uh, I'm glad to see that uh, uh, we've already have, we already have uh, quite a few other member companies on the keynote uh, this morning, uh, Carl Meadows, the director of product there, mentioned uh, contrib major contributions by Intel, by uh, uh, I Ivan, by Arene. So we already see large and small companies involved. And uh, I expect uh, following this move to the Linux Foundation, more uh, vendors will uh, get involved there. So uh, looking forward to that. And there are already like over 40 non-AWS maintainers, uh, repo maintainers on the repo. So it's already uh, happening. So that's open search in a nutshell. And as I mentioned, 
many other tools that I'm not going to cover. I haven't touched open source projects for, uh, for profiling, for example, like Parka and Pixie uh, and uh, various open source uh, databases and alerting tools and, and others. Uh, what's important is that you know how to approach it uh, uh, for your own system and for your own needs and, uh, and uh, goals, okay? So let's uh, wrap up by talking about these goals and uh, remember the various dimensions of observability that we talked about throughout the talk. So uh, we talked about different signal types, we talked about different functionality. So when exploring the tool options, first identify what uh, you need, what your system, uh, what your stack is about, uh, which signals, which sources, so from where are you collecting it? You have a, you have a, a, a MySQL database that you need to uh, fetch data from. You have a, some uh, Zipkin exporter that you need to uh, align with in a brownfield project, some legacy stuff. You need to know where, uh, where you're getting from, uh, in which protocols, what's the functionality that you need and which analytics backend you're going to uh, use. Uh, you have in your company you know, Prometheus across the board, you need to make sure that you can visualize with Prometheus or, or Grafana or, or uh, whatnot, make sure that you know that. And then once you have all of your stack figured out and all these questions answered, then you can look at the tools and, and, and find the ones that cover your, your needs. Um, and of course, then you can approach the CNCF landscape in a more focused and targeted manner. So, um, don't be afraid of the CNCF landscape when you approach it uh, in a targeted fashion and use the, the, the filtering, you can actually find it very, very useful. If you are still uh, concerned about the CNCF landscape, uh, do uh, meet me at the CNCF booth or after the talk here, happy to uh, convince you uh, and, and explain more about how to uh, use it. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for listening. And I believe we have uh, a few minutes for uh, questions, so have you take any questions that uh, you may have? Are yeah. these slides available? Uh, yeah, I, I'll definitely make sure that they are available. I, I provide them to the, to the Linux Foundation. I think they, they upload it to the schedule. So let me check that it's, uh, it's happening, but definitely happy to share. And yeah, lots of QR codes, because I know it's a lot of information in one go. That's why I add the QR codes. I'll make sure that it's available. If not, DM me if I forgot, and I'll, I'll send it personally to you, and then I'll fix it online. Uh, yeah. So, so I do have a question. So in the landscape, there's a number of older tools there, like Nagios and things like that. Yes. Is what's the um, what's what's the, uh, the criteria for being included in the landscape? Is it just that they run in containers, or is it that they, some other thing has happened? So first, let me repeat the question for those who haven't answered and also for the recording. So we, uh, on the landscape, uh, the gentleman mentioned that uh, there are other tools, also older tools like Nagios and others. And the question is, uh, what makes the criteria of uh, being added to the landscape and uh, if it's on containers or whatnot? So the, the, the answer is, and, and I'm not a formal representative of the Linux Foundation here to uh, give you the, the full criteria, but I think... Uh, it's, it's an easy case in terms of the, uh, uh, the open source tools. Nagios is an open source, so it's very easy, but also vendor-wise. Uh, so I don't think you, you have to show that you run on containers. Uh, it's, I think that the, the, the barrier to entry should be very low. It should be that this is sustainable, not a pet project of someone, and it should be something viable that is being used in production and so on, but that's, uh, that's essentially what it means. So yes, you'll see also legacy uh, tools, and it's important because you know many of us are not greenfield or br brownfield projects, and you do need to be able to collect uh, telemetry with statsd, uh, with collectd, with httpd, with I don't know what not, uh, and, and, uh, and, and we need to make sure that our stack is not broken just because we have some uh, legacy pieces there. So uh, very, very important. Anyway, any other questions? CNCF landscape, observability tools, open source vendors. Yes, please. Uh, how hard is the migration from open source to open source? Have you seen some big company try to replace it with, with open source? So, uh, yes, I have. Uh, I used to work for a company called Logs.io that uh, we used to run heavily on uh, Elasticsearch and we migrated to uh, OpenSearch. So I can tell you firsthand that uh, it's definitely big companies, large companies, AWS themselves that ran a whole managed service made the migration. So big migrations happened. And I know since then, uh, many others, they actually they have like case studies on the, on the project website uh, with, with big names there. 
Uh, I can tell you that the migration uh, on the first release, as soon as the fork happened, was pretty smooth because it was one-to-one. -one. The thing is that three years passed and the projects have diverged a bit, like there's more functionality that was added both to Elasticsearch and to OpenSearch. So um, I need to check the migration guide now on the latest releases, depending on which release of uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana you run currently and to which migration. Anyway, you could probably do it two phase, like moving to the equivalent uh, Elasticsearch if you run the open source one to the equivalent back then and then upgrade the open search from that one to the uh, to the latest. So uh, we can talk about migration paths and by the way, you have the open search folks they also have a booth here. So they're, they're more of an authority than me. I don't see any one of the open search team here, so I can't uh, point anyone here, but uh, uh, in general, I've seen lots of them. I can I can tell you that if you are consider, uh, considering it, the earlier the better usually when, when folks are involved because the projects diverge. So it, it becomes uh, more challenging over time. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Um, what is your take on Victoria metrics as an alternative to common tools? So the question was, what's, the, uh, what's my take on Victoria metrics as an alternative pr to Prometheus? So just a word for those who don't know, Victoria metrics is another open source uh, that is owned by a company called Victoria metrics. Uh, and it's uh, essentially an equivalent to Prometheus. It's uh, I would say 90 something percent compatible with Prometheus, not exactly a hundred percent, but uh, very much aligned with Prometheus. Um, and the question is, when you say compare, it really depends on what's important for you. Again, it goes back to what's important for you and for your architecture. It's very difficult to say this is better than that or vice versa. Uh, there, there are several things to consider. First of all, Prometheus, by definition, is a single node architecture. So it has scalability limitation, only vertical scalability. So there are lots, by the way, other projects that I haven't covered that cover the long-term storage for Prometheus to make it scalable, like Thanos and Cortex, naming two projects within the CNCF ecosystem that provides that, or Mimir uh, on, uh, under the Grafana Labs, uh, open source, uh, and, and so on. Um, so there's the scalability. If Prometheus single node is not good for you, obviously you need to look for alternatives, and then Victoria Metrics versus the other solutions, that one dimension that I can uh, name. The other one is the Prometheus compatibility. If you need 100% Prometheus compatibility to be able, let's say, if you need to migrate from an existing installation of Thanos Cortex, uh, Prometheus, whatnot, to Victoria Metrics, there are some differences that you will need to compensate for. Um, like the rate function is built differently. It's still called rate in the PromQL query language, but the semantics of the, the rate, for example, is, is slightly different. So you'll get different results and some things may break. Because, like if you set an alert based on that, suddenly the alerts will spike because the, the semantics is different. So it's another consideration to have, uh, but all in all, it's a very valid project. I know the CTO very well and uh, Alexander and the uh, great team there, very talented. So definitely a strong project and uh, worth, worth looking into depending on your needs. Um, there was another hand here that was, yes, please. looking for something that would give me good metrics and information about networking that I don't want to use something completely different that kind of fits in this architecture, especially layer three networking stuff. And I can't really find exactly what I'm looking for. So, uh, yeah, I think the gentleman actually had an answer, yeah? Yeah, I'm just going to say open NMS kind of fits what you need. I'll quite chat with you later on if you want. <laughs> so... Just to name it, for those who didn't hear, open NMS uh, on, the, uh, on the networking side. For those who, I think they covered it also on the telco overview that they had in the, this morning or yesterday, I forgot. So open NMS, if you want to check it out, another open source in this domain. Um, and uh, Nagios is, is an excellent tool. And it's, it's like long standing and uh, finding an alternative that will give you the same good visibility, but will be cloud native is not a trivial task. I don't think that there is a, a tool that I could say that is fully like one-to-one -one will give you for those who are like heavy Nagios users. There is an adaptation that you will take, to, you'll have to take. Maybe open NMS, uh, it will be uh, a good enough uh, thing, but definitely I, I see that. I can tell you that some do uh, some sort of relay using open telemetry. I don't think that it's one-to-one it's -one equivalent anyway, but uh, yeah, it's a challenge. Um, yes, please, uh, the back. It, 
It was a bit difficult to hear, but you're asking about best practices for distributed architecture with different edge locations. Was that uh, the question? Uh, well, it, it's not exactly the topic of this conversation, so it's, it's, a, it's a whole uh, a huge question and a, a whole different lecture. But I can tell you in a nutshell, if you are looking into open telemetry, which as you can see from my talk, at least it's the emerging uh, way of, of fetching, then open telemetry provides a way, by the way, also Prometheus, uh, a way to provide the federated architecture. So if you, it's only metrics, then federated architecture in Prometheus nodes, by the way, Prometheus has an agent only mode that provides only the metric scraping without the database, uh, the time series database, then you can do a federated architecture where you can have nodes closer to the edges and then another node that, that federates it and so on. Uh, open telemetry collectors can also be used in a similar architecture, so you can do it in layered, you can do that like one that is co-located on the node alongside your application or container or whatnot, and then another one that then collects it. I think it's also the best practice, for example, if you look at Jaeger, I think that's what they recommend also for collecting uh, traces based on Jaeger. Uh, so these are usually the, the typical ways that, uh, that you do that. And obviously each collector can then do uh, uh, roll-ups and sampling and aggregation so that what you send then upstream, especially if it's a low bandwidth, like real edge case, you will send the lower thing. Remember that if you use OTLP, it runs over gRPC, so you get more compression and, and more uh, efficient uh, uh, upstream uh, or downstream, sorry, uh, like uh, uh, transformation of the, the data. So these are usually the, the, the practices that are used. Um, there was another hand that raised, I think. Anyone else? Okay, so thank you very much for listening.